Hey, good evening, everyone. It is uh, good to to see you all. See you all. Wow. Uh, and be seen. That's right. It's been it's been a day. You know. Um, I am trying to get to. Here we are. Cool. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's great to see all of you and talk to all of you. Uh, I know last week the uh, the folder that I had posted did not work because we changed all our emails over and so where documents were housed changed. So I'm actually gonna shift to this side so you guys can see what's here. Am I still in the picture? You're good enough, you're perfect. All right, awesome, cool. Well, while we're doing that, I'm also gonna grab my beverages and move them over. Um, when I wrote stuff up on the board, I wasn't really thinking about how much space there was on the board and where I needed to position myself. Um, but now I get to see the room from this perspective. So I get to see the world a whole new way, right? Um, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but it is great to see you all. Uh, let's, let's pray and then let's dive into tonight's text. Father God, I come before you, Lord, and I thank you for today, for the opportunity we have to gather together to study your word. Um, I'm excited for tonight, God, and what we get to share and talk about and, and like kind of the joy that comes with what we're talking about tonight. So God, I just ask that our hearts would be open to hear what you'd speak. Um, God, that we would see and know your goodness in this time. And so we commit our service to you in your name. Amen. All right, so our text is Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Um, so we're only going to do a small section of the text. And if you're wondering if I can talk for an hour and five minutes on 10 verses, you bet I can. Uh, so if you're joining us online, the link should be there. You can get your documents there. Um, our intent and purpose every week is to have Berean hearts, to search and understand the scriptures, um, that we may discern what truth is, and to answer questions like, what does this tell us about God's ways, his heart, and his character? And we'll get into that a little bit this week very specifically. Um, and then how is this text useful, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work? And, and as I've said before, we don't always answer each of those questions very specifically. Like, I'm not going to give you answers to each of those, but those are primers that should help shape any of our reading of Scripture, um, but specifically our time together. So to catch us up, uh, right, we've seen how there's the spectrum of churches and, and how the letter speaks to each of these major groups differently. You've got uh, a persecuted church, you have a complacent church, and you have a compromising church. And, and different passages will resonate differently with each of those, and we've tried to highlight them. Um, We've said that the consistent and recurring vision or focal point of this text is worship before the throne. It's the first thing John sees. It is a continuous interlude. It brings us back to that. And then this week is the same way as we go back into another section of worship. Um, we finished the, 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 the seals and trumpets and bowls and all that. And then we met the beasts, right? Or the beast. The beast who was being ridden by the harlot, and, and we talked about, and, and we had the robust descriptions of who uh, and what they looked like. And we talk about how like the harlot is, is for John's audience, is likely identified with, with Rome and Jerusalem, and, and beast is the, uh, the, 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 the satanic power that upholds secular rule. That inevitably, human governance, human power structure is not godly at its nature. It is marked by sin. Inevitably it is, because all things human touch are marked by sin. And so especially secular governance is even more so marked by sin and ultimately stands in opposition to God. Um, and, and what we see here is you've got like a power structure, a city. Um, the city that sits on seven hills, or the, the, heads, the heads of the dragon are identified as the seven hills um, and are the seven mountains that the city is, that the harlot is sit, rested upon. Um, and that stands in opposition to the people of God. And so we heard her described, and, and we heard the people who have partnered with her. And then last week, we saw, the, uh, the, we, we saw her destruction. And, and actually, we don't directly see her destruction. We hear about Babylon's destruction secondhand. Like already it's secondhand because it's a vision from John, 
but John doesn't actually see Babylon's destruction. He hears the testimony of Babylon's destruction from those who are suffering as a result. There were the kings that allied with her that no longer have this ally, this power structure, this buttress to support their power structure. Uh, you see the, the merchants who own goods, and we talked about how like human beings are listed among the, the goods that are traded um, and how inevitably secular power structure reduces humans to commodities. And we hear like the, the sea captains, the ones who are the, 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 the transit line of the merchants, of the goods to be sold, um, and how they all lament, but they're not lamenting for Babylon. They're lamenting at the loss of their position because of Babylon's fall. Um, and then ultimately at the end of last week, well, we saw that the, the angel throws a millstone into the sea uh, as a prophetic act and, and, and declares and accuses Babylon of, of carrying the blood of the prophets, the apostles and the saints on her. Um, we see that the result is that De Babylon has become a desolate place. And, and ultimately one of the conclusions we came to is that like you are either complicit with Babylon or you are for the lamb. Like there are no neutral acts in life. Everything either bears witness to the lamb or it doesn't. Um, and humans are complicated. And so sometimes things get complicated. And so like, it's not like what that like differentiation in acts looks like, because maybe the act itself testifies to God, but my heart condition doesn't. And so in that, like, or, or my attitude about it doesn't. And so to different perspectives, someone who sees me complaining about doing a good act uh, or, or a, a testifying act may receive bad witness from it, whereas someone who hears the testimony might receive good witness from it, right? A pastor preaches a great message and people hear that and that may be great. And then he goes back and berates his kids and yells at his wife and gets flips out on the, the restaurant server or something like those two acts like held in, in, in companionship with each other, like may seemingly be great, but they might not. Right. You know, the worship pastor that yells at all his worship team and tells them they're a bunch of failures right before going up and praising God. Uh, you know, those are the. It's, it gets ugly sometimes. So all that to say is that like when we are trying to evaluate our life and our actions, yes, things are complicated. Um, and, and as I said last week, like, do we need to sit there and say, all right, should I move my left foot or my right foot? God, show me which step to take. Maybe if that's what God calls you to, maybe. But for the most part, that's not how we have to function because the Holy Spirit is lavishly gifted to us to help guide us and shape our path. And so this week, we have a complete change. Well, not a complete change. We have a change of scenery and a change of, of tone. Um, and this section is an interlude of worship. It's short. It's 10 verses. And our, our attention, which has for the last two chapters, for the last, oh, uh, let's see, uh, 40 verses or so has been focused on the wickedness of the harlot and the beast once again now is refocused. Actually, we have for almost like three or four chapters, we have focused on destruction and now we are bringing it back once again. Because remember, the book is not primarily about destruction. It is primarily about the Lamb. And so we're coming back to the Lamb, to rejoicing in heaven, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to get to all these questions as we get there. Because this is an interesting theological event. The marriage <laughs> supper of the Lamb, which we'll get to in a few verses, is only ever mentioned this one time in the book of Revelation. Like in that terms. So... The marriage, but so the church, the relationship between God and his people is often described as the bride and bridegroom. Um, we talk about like the marriage and or, or Jesus uses marriage ceremonies. Many of his parables are surrounded by marriage. So marital language or wedding language is prevalent throughout. But the only time something is ever directly called the marriage supper of the Lamb is right here in this section. And there's questions we should have. This is, it, it, John is not drawing uh, 
from a previous theological point. He is drawing from the totality of witness of the understanding of Jesus' return, his relationship with his people, and he is using this language, or the angels, God is using this language and relaying it through John um, to us. So we're going to ask some interesting questions here. So let's begin. We're going to read verses 1 and 2 uh, to start. Or we'll do 1 through 3, because I think your handout is 1 through 3. So Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 through 3. So after this, so this is after like the, 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 the judgment has been proclaimed upon Babylon, and we've witnessed her destruction. Um, or we've heard of her destruction. After this, I, John, heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore, the great harlot, a Babylon who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the, the blood of his servants. Once more they said, Hallelujah, the smoke goes up from her forever and ever. So, this already this, this may sit a little uncomfortable with us a bit. Um, and we'll get that. We, we, we see, we, John hears the voice of a great multitude. He does not see who this multitude is, but he hears what sounds like the voice of a great multitude. Um, and previously, we've met the great multitude. I want to say in Revelation chapter 5 or 6 um, is the sealing of the 144,000, right? I, uh, I heard them talk about 144,000 that were sealed. I turned and looked, and behold, a great multitude uh, that was worshiping God in heaven. So presumably, this voice is the voice of the redeemed. Uh, how, if that's 144,000 people or a bajillion people, that's not the point. This is the voice of the redeemed in heaven, worshiping and crying out to God. And we have the tri trifold affirmation of God's being, that salvation, Jesus, God is the Savior. It is, salvation resides exclusively and wholly in God. A glory resides exclusively and wholly in God, right? Uh, and, which challenged, or, and, and, uh, and power resides exclusively and wholly in God. And those are three uh, concepts that Rome claimed for themselves, or that all power structures say, like, vote for our party or you won't be like, we can save it, right? We're going to, to the, our country's going down the drain and this party can save it. Now listen, salvation exclusively exists in God, not in a power structure. Rome, behold, the savior of Rome, like that was how Caesar was identified. But Caesar could not be a savior. He could only suppress challenges to his power. Um, glory, the idea for the glory of Rome, right? Or for the glory of whatever. We use the term glory pretty, uh, pretty cavalierly for something that is inherently a theological concept, right? Um, and man, okay, we're going to do it. Like we are very cavalier with that term, perhaps sacrilegious with that term in the things that we ascribe glory to, right? We call our flag old glory, right? And we can have lots of questions about the flag, but glory is not an attribute of a cloth piece. A glory is an attribute of God. And it is something that is only due to God. And then we say, well, there's glory to God, and then there's glory we give to other things, and those are distinctly different things. Well, not necessarily. Um, and that's a much more complicated thing. But glory as a concept is exclusively rooted in God. And any power structure that claims to be uh, the focus or the deserving of glory is seeking to supplant God. We don't like hearing that. Some of us don't like hearing that. Maybe not in this room. Some people in the world, parts of the Christian church might not like hearing that. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Yeah. Well, glory, glory, hallelujah is the battle hymn of the Republic, yeah. which is, yeah, which that's a, we talked about that a few weeks back. And then power, right? Power belongs to God. Inevitably, the challenge of this book is what do we seek or what do we pursue from a power standpoint, right? Are we, is our witness the belief in God's eternal power and his control over the earth, even if we don't always actively see his power in this life, right? Or will we instead pursue 
power that we can more tangibly see. Like, most of us have never seen the equivalent of an Abrams tank from God, right? Abrams tanks are power that we can see and touch and invoke fear. Like, a lot of times when we understand, like, God's power resides in who he is in heaven and he enacts it on the earth, but it's tempting to look at temporary power. Just like if we believe that God is our provider, sometimes it's easier to look at earthly provision or earthly sources of provision because it's something we can touch, something we can feel. It's something that we can like more tacitly engage with. But like all of those are exclusively God's that he gives out to people and that he empowers people with, which then people can corrupt in their sinfulness. But inherently it belongs to God and it will all stand accountable to God. Yes, Pastor Dale. No, I was just going to say, we've got finite minds trying to conceive infinite concepts. Absolutely. Finite minds trying to conceive infinite concepts. Um, and so, like, this, this, this trifold claim, right, um, strikes at the heart of the book's challenge, right? Will we look to worldly power for salvation? Will the church of Ephesus all right, or the seven churches, right? who this is written to, are they going to look to worldly power for their salvation? Will they glorify worldly power? Or will they trust worldly power? Or will they be- recognize that belongs to God? For the people hearing this, inevitably this is, hey guys, are you going to follow Rome or are you going to follow God? Which is more, and it's not, which are you more scared of? Because we don't need to be scared into following God. Scared it is not a word. We don't need to be, we don't, uh, uh, like, worship for our God is not out of, like, fright, um, but it is out of love, right? And then we hear, like, and, and we hear the affirmation that God's judgment is true and just. Um, and this is one of the things that, that we have to, sometimes people struggle with, like, the violent God of the Old Testament versus the loving Jesus of the New Testament. But, you know, Revelation also talks about a God that judges. And, and this is all who God is. Every part of, of, of the, like, the same God that sent the angel of death is the one that died and said, no greater had love have a man that he laid down his life for a friend, right? Who said, turn the other cheek. All of those are realities of who God is. And that's a complicated discussion. And, 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 and we definitely don't have a lot of time to like unpack how like the loving Jesus who came as a baby to sacrifice is, was just as much a part of the Godhead and active in the Godhead when the Malachites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Hittites were destroyed in the land of Canaan, right? It wasn't that Jesus was asleep while the Father was smiting people and then he woke up and was like, hey, maybe let's chill. That's not how it happened. But here once again, like the, the, the justness of what God is and that God's judgment and destruction of that which stands in opposition to him is inherently true and just. And you say, well, how is that? Honestly, I probably can't explain it to you, but God tells us it is, and therefore it must be, because God can't lie. And if you say, well, what if he's lying? Well, then I don't know if this is the right class for it, man. Like, <laughs> we, we, we got some deeper issues we gotta unsettle here. Um, and that's something that we have to, to also just remember. Like God repeatedly says that his actions don't make sense by human standards. They just don't. Um, but even as we've seen, even here, even just a chapter before, right, God was urging his people to come out of Babylon. Like even here in the destruction of Babylon, it was tempered with the opportunity, continual opportunity for repentance to come. But ultimately, God is the just judge of the wicked. And, and this is also just a core part of who God is, right? It is the promise that God made in the Old Covenant and, and, and in the New Covenant, right, that he would judge the wicked. You see it in Jesus' teachings. The same Jesus that says, turn the other cheek, talks about the separation of the sheep from the goats, right? It talks about the wheat and the tares, and they all get burnt up, right? He uses that imagery in his language. It's not absent from Jesus' teachings. No matter what we want to think about, like a lovey Jesus, there's absolutely judgment talked about in his, and like in his teaching, ultimately. Yes? Like, yeah. No, your God is just. He's not not paying attention. He does not care about you. Yeah. He's going to take care of it. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, that's a great point, right? 
For the church that is compromising or complacent, this is a warning. But for the church that is persecuted, this is encouragement. It's, listen, you will be vindicated in this. Um, you know, for, the, for the, 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 the prophets, the saints, and the martyrs whose blood was found in Babylon, who we saw their blood crying out from under the altar as it pooled, like, God, when will you bring judgment? Like, here it is. Um, a quote from Revelation in the End of All Things, Craig Coaster says this, The multitudes praise God for the salvation that he has brought. In this context, salvation refers to deliverance from the oppressive power of Babylon, whose smoke goes up forever and ever as a sign that its demise is permanent. Some readers may be troubled by the idea of celebrating such a victory, preferring a gentler version of the gospel. But the context suggests that joy is appropriate. Babylon was responsible for corrupting the earth and shedding the blood of the saints. Those who have been subjected to this corruption and whose lives have been threatened by the city's oppressive power will find blessed relief when the oppression is lifted. Which also, just a comment. Yeah, okay, I'm going to say it. Um, one of the, a, a more modern uh, theological framework is called liberation theology. Right, and it comes from uh, Latin America, um, and and it's uh, like uh, Gustavo Gutierrez is, is one of the the the, the famous um, theologians who is like the father of liberation theology. Uh, basically, it is, and, and you see this also in, in in like Black Church theology, and that is the idea of God as liberator, um, and. I know in our world today and in, in America today, you talk too much about like liberation of the oppressed, right? You start being accused of being woke. But ultimately, that's what is happening here. God's promise is that he is the liberator. Like part of the gospel of Jesus is that he is the one who casts off chains, who overthrows oppression, right? And will set captives free. Um, and uh, as, as we've moved through the 20th century, people who have historically been oppressed have really drawn into that identity um, and, and have allowed and, and, and have read the Bible through that lens. I mean, that's the story of God in Egypt, that God the liberator from the oppression of Egypt, God the liberator from the oppression of Rome. That's, Paul had that many times, right? And ultimately, God the liberator from the oppression of Babylon. And so Egypt, Rome, Babylon, empire, whoever else throughout history, ultimately, like liberation of people who are oppressed is part of what God's desire is. I've come to set the captives free is part of what Jesus says he's here to do. Um, no, go ahead. You don't need to apologize. I mean, if you think of Babylon as a system and not just one kind of mean lady who has some redeeming qualities, like, no, this is the worst possible mix of religion and power just only for oppression in its own self, the idea that its demise is permanent, like, yeah. no, there's, there's no more. Yeah. There's and no more. Like, because it has no, it's not like a nice, kind of mean lady. Like, no, this is a horrible system that the Lord has said enough. Yeah. And so Angela brings up a great point, right? Like, one, this is like a permanent reality. This is like the ultimate fulfillment of it. And, and, Nobody is sitting here saying, you know, Babylon, you know, they made some mistakes, but there's some really good things that came from it, right? There's some really good foundations, and we shouldn't get rid of Babylon just because maybe there were some bad emperors. Um, ultimately, it's about, like, the corrupt system that stands against the power of God is destroyed fully because there can be no goodness in it. It may do things that seemingly have positive outcomes, but goodness exists in God and God alone. And so as long as it stands in opposition to God, it cannot inherently be good. It can do things ultimately that draw people to God. Rome's oppression drew a ton of people to God. Oppression drives people to God throughout history. That doesn't make that action good. That makes God's power greater. It's the heart behind the system. Absolutely. It's the heart behind the system. All right. Verses 4 and 5. Oh, yeah, we're definitely going the whole time. We're good. Four and five. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And then from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, 
all you his servants, and all who fear him, small and great. So once again, we, we meet characters, for lack of a better term, that we've met before. The elders are back, the, the, the living creatures are back, and just like as we read through in Revelation 4 and 5, and then in, I think, Revelation 7, maybe 8, We've got the multitudes worshiping, we have the elders worshiping, we have the living creatures giving praise to the Father on the throne. And then we hear a voice from the throne. And so the question is, whose voice is that? Uh, well, what they say is like, praise our God. Um, all you his servants, right? All you who fear him great and small. And so we have to ask, well, okay, who is this? Who is the person talking here? Um, and we don't know. John doesn't tell us. Uh, the thoughts perhaps being that like on the throne is the father and next to the throne is the son and everyone else is around the throne. So if it's coming from the throne, it has to be father or son who is speaking right now, right? The lamb or the father. And so potentially it is the son. And he, when he says like, praise our God, right? It is the identity. It's, it's not saying that the son is inherently separate from the father, right? It is the God calling, God calling people to praise God because he's God, not praise me. It's praise God. He just happens to also be God, right? It's just saying, listen to the pastor, and it's like, it's not quite the same as saying, listen to me, even though functionally it's the same thing. Um, and like, all you who fear him, right? And, and we talked about this just, well, we haven't actually talked a ton about fear of God. Um, and there's a lot to be said about what fear of the Lord looks like. Um, it is not necessarily fright of the Lord. It's not being necessarily scared of God. It is reverential awe. Um, and sometimes, because we are humans, in this human existence, because we are still marked by sin, when we see the revelation of the fullness of God, it scares us. As we are confronted by perfect, unmatched purity, our broken, sinful reality is frightened of that. But we know that that is not inevitably or inherently what relationship with God looks like. Adam and Eve were not afraid of God until sin marred their life. And as we will see later, in the new heavens and new earth, we won't be afraid of God anymore. It is only like the, the brokenness in us that would ever drive us to being actually afraid of God, right? Because perfect love drives out all fear, which includes the fear that sin brings because perfect love is Jesus' sacrifice. And through Jesus' sacrifice, we get admission to the kingdom of God and we can stand blameless before God and there is no more fear. So any fear we have of God's judgment or whatever, it's not because of who God is. It, it's not because of the, the I, like any fear I have of God is not fear of judgment. It's not fear of wrath from God. It is the brokenness in me standing before the perfection of who God is. And nothing broken can stand in the sight of the glory of God, which is why we have Jesus Christ. So that the brokenness in us can be made whole. So fear of God here is more of reverential awe than frightenedness of God. We have an altar call now? Amen. Hallelujah, right? Yeah. If you need the blood of Jesus, we got it. <laughs> well, you have it. You have access to it. So verses 6 through 8, our next section. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the great multitude, of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. <laughs> Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready to her. It has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints of the saints. So this is a great section. Um, so this voice that cries out, we don't know whose it is, but we know how it is described, right? A loud voice, uh, a voice like uh, uh, many waters or rushing waters. Um, 
We have um, uh, like th- sounds of thunder crying out, peals of thunder. Those terms are used in Revelation chapter 1 to describe the voice of the Son of Man. In Revelation chapter 1, when he speaks, it says the Son of Man has a voice like rushing water. Right In Revelation chapter 4, when, we, when John is brought up to the throne room, we, we see that, that, that peals of thunder surround the throne of heaven. They emanate forth from the throne of heaven. So it, the, 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 the person behind this voice is most likely the, the, the Son of Man. Jesus Christ, the Lamb, because that is the individual that these attributes or these descriptors are only ever applied to in this book. Um, And so this is Jesus crying out. So even here, Jesus is joining in with worship of God himself, not that Jesus is separate, um, but from, from like the triune God, but Jesus also understands his distinction from the Father, right? Jesus living on earth, right, worships the Father. He says that. He tells us that he does that. Um, And here we have it going again. And and he cries out in praise, right? The Lord our God and and, and the Almighty. It's interesting because this is the second time that God is described as the Almighty in Revelation. And it's, I think, the only two times that God is described as the Almighty in the entire New Testament. The Almighty is a descriptor from the Old Testament, and it most often means like the God of armies, the Lord of hosts, the Almighty, which is is relevant because the next section we're going to come to is Jesus leading like the the armies of heaven, right? The the rider on the white horse. Um, But here we talk about like God is the one in charge. Like we've heard, we've seen all of these images of, of armies, of locusts, of horses with scorpion tails, of, of, of all of this death and destruction. And yet, once again, like the book began with God is the Almighty, the one who is the Lord of hosts, the one who controls the armies of heaven. And here again, God is the Almighty One, the Lord of hosts. So any claim of power that that, that Rome could make or any other entity could make is inherently challenged by God's identity as the Almighty, the Lord of hosts. We've talked about like the spiritual war. We, t- we heard about Michael and the archangel in Revelation 12, waging war against the dragon that tried to eat up the child. Um, and the dragon being cast down. Like we hear about like the war that, that the beasts of the sea and the land wage against the saints. But once again, God is the Almighty One. So any army from the, that the angel of the pit could well up when I think the, one of the trumpets is blown or one of the bowls is poured out and the angel of the pit rises with an army of, I think it's frogs or something, I don't know. There's an army of scary stuff. I can't, honestly can't remember off the top of my head. But all of those claims of even spiritual power, right? Because the angel of the pit might be bringing demons to fight. But ultimately, God is still the Almighty, the Lord of hosts. That is like the framework of all of these descriptions. Like, we start out, God is Almighty. Then we have, hey, I hear about all the stuff going on in your life. Those are the chapters, the letters. Then John goes to heaven, there's worship, and then there's all these images of plagues and destruction and warfare and pain and suffering, which are intermixed with God's glory and witness and worship of God. And ultimately here, the other bookend is, hey, God, God's the guy. He's got the power. He's the Lord, the Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the one who conquers. And here we have like the, 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 the marriage supper of the Lamb is here. Um, or it says, for the, la- the marriage of the Lamb has come. It is at hand. And the bride has made herself ready. She has put on her wedding dress. Um, and and like in this case, it's bright linen. And I, don't know, I can't imagine most wedding dresses today are made of linen. But if they are, like that's fine. It, the, the material is not super as what's relevant here. Though I think, no, I don't, I'm good. That's pure speculation. I'm not going to make that statement. I know linen is used in various material in the Old Testament. It might be that the priest's clothes are made of linen, but I don't know for certain. But it's highly regarded. Well, yeah. The point I don't know if I, I, I don't know off the top of my head if there is like theological comparison between like oh this is like priestly garb and now she has a wedding dress. I don't know because I can't remember what the priest's clothes are made of. Some of them were. Yeah. 
But anyways, linen's fine. That's, that's not, I'm not trying to bash linen. That's not the point. Um, I am trying to move on. But someone had to make comments. <laughs> um, um, and, and the fine linen, the dress that the spotless bride is wearing are the, the righteous deeds of the saints, the works of God's people. So there's, we're, we're still not going to get yet at the conversation of the marriage supper of the Lamb um, because we're going to get that in, in the next two verses, or in the next verse, really. Um, but there's a ton here. So God is almighty. The time has, actually, we have to kind of do it now. So the marriage of the Lamb is at hand. Um, and the bride has, been made, has made herself ready right? It's not that someone else made the bride ready. It's that the bride has made herself ready. And she has made herself ready by getting dressed for the wedding. And she is dressed in the righteous acts that she has done. So there's a lot of layers here, right? If righteous acts are how we get ready to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Then there is once again a place where the works of the saints matter. Right? It is not, and I think what I say in, in the handout is that, uh, like, works don't cause us to be saved. Right? Works are not what causes our salvation. But there is still a causal link between our works and our participation in the eschaton. Like, and, and, like, I think most of us generally get, like most of us probably didn't say, well, I prayed a prayer once and I can do whatever I want now. There are definitely Christians that do that. And there, that's definitely a reality. I think for most people in this room, we understand that. But I, I, I think we need, like, we have to take that super seriously. Like that is something that is, and like as I've said, like there are no net neutral acts. There's nothing that's like, oh, no. It's, it's not like there's a, you know, there, there's a TV show called The Good Place, and it's like, oh, well, you have, like, all your acts are weighted a point value, and you have positive points at the end of life or not. Like, that's not how it works. It's about the continual decision we have each day to pursue righteousness with our acts, which then also draws other people into righteousness, and which clothes us and prepares us to meet the Lamb. Um, and it's not like there's the scales of justice aren't necessarily sitting there. Um, and, and even if they are, like the blood of the lamb is on, in, on our favor. But like we still have to do our part to make ourselves ready for the marriage supper. And we make ourselves ready before the marriage begins, right? Before the marriage supper happens. It's not, hey, we're here. Now it's time to make ourselves ready. It is the process that gets us to the marriage supper. And we're going to, hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about Jewish weddings. Um, in, in Jewish wedding culture, um, when a, a bride and groom uh, became engaged or betrothed, that was a legally binding reality. That woman was considered, there's no like breaking off engagement. There were, but it was not a simple act, right? They were considered functionally married from legal purposes. A betrothed woman had the rights of a wife if her husband died, right? Those were, she had the protections of a wife. And so like if a husband mistreated his betrothed, he would be judged the same way as if he had mistreated his wife. She was called his wife, and we see this, like Mary is called Joseph's wife while they were still betrothed. So the betrothal begins when the groom or the groom's father and the bride's father make the betrothal pact. They agree upon a dowry price, like the bride price, whatever he would pay her. And then you would have the betrothal period. And this was the time that the bride would get herself ready, like, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, whatever, to be married, and the groom would get, earn the money to pay the bride price. This could be weeks, months, whatever it was. And then, as the time got close, the announcement of the marriage feast would happen. You'd have the first announcement, hey, they're going to have a marriage feast. And then you'd have another announcement, hey, it's happening today. And then the groom and his groomsmen, or the bridegroom and his groomsmen, would go from his house pick up the bride and her entourage and 
escort her back to his home or his father's home where they would have marriage supper. And you never knew exactly when it was. You knew it was the marriage supper is happening, right? You had the first one. And this is why Jesus uses all these images. The first announcement, there's going to be a marriage supper. All right, it's happening really soon. So get ready. And then all the bridesmaids come out. And like, so I did a wedding yesterday. And, you know, we said it was going to start at three o'clock. And I was getting ready to start at three o'clock. And then people were like, hey, listen, not everyone's going to show up on time. Maybe start a few minutes late. I'm like, why can't people be on time? <laughs> um, but like in Jewish culture, like it wasn't like that. It was, you knew weeks in advance that the time was coming. You knew hours in advance that it was happening, but you didn't know exactly what time the bride was walking down the aisle which is why the, the, the virgins had to have, or the bridesmaids, right, had to have oil in their lamp, and the ones that weren't, weren't ready, right? The bride didn't know when her groom was coming until the herald would come and say, yo, the groom's coming, right? The second announcement would be like, hey, it's happening like today, but the bride had to get ready today. When the groom showed up, she had to be dressed and ready to go. It wasn't like, all right, hey, give me five minutes. Let me get my, my wedding dress on now when the groom shows up. She is ready when the groom comes, right? The, the, the coming of the groom was imminent. It was happening any moment. And then the groom would take the bride to his house. And it, it, if the thinly veiled theological significance of this, like it hasn't been pierced through, right? Just like Jesus has announced, I am your savior. Jesus says, I am coming soon. Everyone needs to be prepared, both like the, like the virgins, right? We have to have the oil in our lamps. We have to have made ourselves ready for when the groom shows up. When the groom shows up, the bride needs to be ready, which means she has to have her dress on, which means she's got to be clothed in the righteous deeds of the life of bearing faithful witness to the lamb. As the lamb comes, the groom comes to take the bride, his church, back to his father's house to feast. That is the story here. And, and in Jesus's life, Part of the, 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 the we, because one of the examples we talk here about is like, hey, the first set of guests were like, oh, hey, can we maybe delay? And so the, the, the host was like, no, no, like, like the one guy, one of the parables of the wedding feast, and I don't know if we've talked about this one on Sunday yet, um, but like there's the first one, and, and then he goes out, and, and they're like, well, I'm so in my field. Sorry, man, I'm a little busy. And, and so the groom, the, 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 the host says, well, then go get everybody off the streets, get the beggars, bring them in. And, and, and so much of that story is Jesus' reality. Like, it was announced, the Messiah is coming. The, 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 the betrothal has been announced. The, the wedding feast is coming soon. And then when the hour came, when it's like, hey, it's happening imminently, there were all of the people of Israel that were like, hey, man, it's not the right time. Can we try and like get married a different time? Like, I'm not ready to go to the marriage supper because I got other stuff to deal with. And that's why... They were rejected by God because they rejected the Messiah. And instead, God went and invited the beggars, the lame, the people from the streets and highways, the Gentiles, right? So the betrothal of God's chosen people changed. The wedding guest list changed because the first guests, uh, many of the first guests did not accept it. So here we are, right? That places us. We are imminently awaiting the arrival of the groom to take us to his father's house. Um, and it's complicated because he came in Jesus Christ, right? And then he is going to his father's house and we are going to follow him when he comes back to bring us. Um, so it's not like a, a perfect analogy of a wedding feast, right? Because the groom came, the groom left, promised to make the house ready and is coming back again. Um, and really the new covenant is a new betrothal. A betrothal is a covenant. It's a new covenant, which is why, right? I talked about this yesterday at the wedding I did, is that like, uh, like our marriages inherently point to that reality, right? They are a, just like everything we do is supposed to point to God, right? It is a prophetic act which points toward the reality that we are coming to the marriage of the Lamb, right? Marriage, any point today, that act of union is a, a, literal and symbolic expression and spiritual expression of what God and the church will have in the fullness of time. <clears throat> um, we're going to derail for a second. We're going to talk about the word hallelujah. Um, and that's because 
This is a fascinating word. First, it is a Hebrew word. It is not a Greek word. Um, second, it appears four times in the entirety of the New Testament, and all of them take place in the first six verses of this chapter. So, it also, hallelujah, appears approximately 23 times in the Old Testament. It depends on if you look at the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek Old Testament. Um, but, but the word hallelujah is, a, is a, a, it's a, a combination of two words. Hallelu, which means praise, and Yah, Yahweh. So it means praise Yahweh. And it is a word that, because there's a ton of times in, in the, the, the Psalms where they say praise the Lord, but they don't use the word hallelujah. They use the word for praise, and then they use the word for Yahweh. Hallelu, hallelu Yahweh, as two separate words. But there's only 23 times when they mash them together into the one phrase, hallelujah. And that word only occurs here four times. And the word amen is here, which is also a Hebrew word. So John, in this six-verse passage, is drawing these very, very specific and theologically important Hebrew terms um, into this passage. And and. Every other instance of hallelujah as a word exists exclusively in the Psalms. You will not find the word hallelujah outside of the Psalms or Revelation chapter 19. And in the Psalms, it only appears in the last third. The first time this word appears in the Psalms is in Psalm 104, and then you see it uh, all the way through Psalm 150. It opens and closes Psalm 150. So, Hallelujah is inherently a liturgical phrase. You find it almost exclusively at the opening of a psalm or at the title of a psalm or as the closing cry of the psalm. It is a bookend. It either introduces us. It sets the tone for what's about to take place. Or it closes. It is the final, kind of like we would say amen. It is how we end the psalm of praise. And you find it here a ton of times, and it happens at the beginning. Hallelujah, which sets the tone. Praise Yahweh, followed by what that praise looks like. Uh, maybe an equivalent would be like if we said, let us pray, right? That's not the prayer, but it's what sets the tone for the prayer. Um, and then it ends with, so in this one, right? So first time in verse one, I heard them saying, praise the Lord. One, hallelujah. Once more, they said, hallelujah. In verse four, amen, hallelujah. Two very specific liturgical terms that mattered immensely to the Jewish people. It is a tying together of the worship of God of the Old Testament with the worship of God in kingdom come. So if we're at any church that says that like, well, there's no place for, for those, there's no listen, this is the same worship that we have. That like the worship the psalmists are doing is the same worship that resonates in the heavens. Um, and then finally, this last declaration of praise uh, in, in verse 6, once again comes hallelujah, praise to the Lord. Um, and, and it's a great image of liturgy. Um, Kind of like a, a reader response, right? You have the multitude, then you have the elders, and then you have another voice. Um, and, and, you know, we, uh, so we come from what's called the low church tradition. Um, that doesn't, is not a dig on us at all. So you have the high church tradition and the low church tradition. Uh, the low church tradition is going to be like your Baptists, your non-denominational, uh, your Pentecostals, and, and many others. But your big ones are going to be like your Baptists and Pentecostals. Um, and high church tradition are going to be Presbyterians, Lutherans, Catholics, Anglicans, uh, Greek Orthodox, um, the United Church of Christ. And maybe the, uh, and, and there's unfairly a rap that, you know, the high church tradition are stuffy and boring and, you know, the Pentecostal church is fun and exciting. Um, and I remember thinking that. I went to a Lutheran school and I was like, wow, their church is so boring. Mm -hmm. Going to church service is so boring there. All right. The, 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 the person up front says something and I read a response out of the book. Right. Um, and then I sit down and then I stand up and I kneel down and, and, and it can seem very stuffy except that it appears in the book of Revelation. 
Like that service like is just as holy and open to the spirit as anything we do here. And we say, well, I don't feel it. Well, bro, let me tell you, if you're worried about having to kneel down and stand back up and kneel down and stand back up, well, Revelation's told us that's literally what the elders do every single day, every single hour for all eternity. And if we can't handle a 45-minute service where we have to do that, like, bro, you're going to be for a, for a wake-up call in heaven. Um, like, and so like those, those service structures, we can call them stuff, we can call them whatever they want, um, but they are deeply, deeply religious. They are based on what the, they, they draw from expressions and realities that we see described in heaven. It's similar to how like Jewish worship took place in the synagogues, right? Because the first Christians were Jews and their worship kind of came from that. And so the, this idea of like a reader calling out and response from the audience, the idea of like repeating the same sacred phrases every single time you gather, right? Those are important. Those are what people, that's what we see is happening here in the throne room. Um, and so I just, all I would say is that like, uh, like all of those are, are very specific things. Even the idea of like incense, like I know some people don't love the idea of incense or like the priest waving incense, except that that's something we see in heaven, right? The prayers of the saints are incense. And so if like by burning incense, it's not because they love the smell of incense, right? It's because that is symbolic and it is a spiritually significant act that reflects a heavenly reality. Um, just like what we do in our churches. And so all that to say, I certainly have grown to appreciate it. And some people unnecessarily uh, and inappropriately are overly critical of, of high church liturgical services. Um, but when we recognize the scriptural foundation for like every part of it, um, hopefully we can, we can draw something from it and allow the spirit to move in that. Um, the language of the liturgy is God-centric. Right in the liturgy, and just like we have here, it's not necessarily language of like God give me this or right, or God be with me. It is language that is God focused. It is God. This is who you are, God. This is you are deserving of praise. It is like as Pastor Ryan would call it, like vertical worship instead of like horizontal worship. Right. It is not. And 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 there's a lot of of. Pastor and I are actually having a discussion about this uh, last week, right? There's a lot of songs we sing today that are functionally prayers. God, give me this. God, be with me here, which are great. But that's not corporate worship the way the Bible describes it. Corporate worship is worship of God and is focused on God. And well, yeah, sure, me asking for God is focused. God, asking God for things is focused on God. No, it's not. It's focused on me. And there's place for that. There's prayer. There's supplication, right? There's, there's edification. There's all those other things. But like the worship we see here is exclusively focused on God, who God is, what God has yet to do, and what God will do, and what God has done. All right. We'll do verses 9 and 10, and then we're going to dig into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, no, we'll just do verse 9 for now. Let me see, where is verse 10? Okay, yeah, so we'll do verse 9. And the angel said to me, we don't know which angel this is, an angel that John has been encountering. It's probably the angel that had one of the bulls that introduced him to Babylon in chapters 18. Um, the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So this is the fourth beatitude. Um, this is also like, I think the third time John has been told to write something down. There have been a couple of specific times where like at the very beginning, uh, Jesus said, write down the words of this prophecy. Um, I believe in when the, the, I don't remember. I know there's another time where John has been told to write something down. And once again, we've been told to write down this beatitude. That blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God. Um, so let's, let's talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, so the, the, just like in our weddings, right? Once the groom got the bride and had the processional back to the groom's house, they feasted. It was like a seven-day feast. Um, 
And then ultimately on the last day is like when, and, and they would feast until everybody left, right? The, the bride and groom didn't get sent off. Everyone else just left and they stayed in their home. Um, and this is the only time this specific phrase is used. Um, and, and so the question here, right? Who are the bride and who are the guests? So the marriage supper of the lamb is the bridegroom marrying the bride. And the beatitude is blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And so the question is, one of those, if, if the bride is the church, who are the guests? Because Jesus uses the guests as examples in his parables, which often is interpreted to refer to the Gentiles being welcomed into the covenant. Um, but in this instance, who are the guests? And then when does this event take place? Like in the timeline of history, when does the event, the marriage supper of the lamb occur? Um, because these are interesting and challenging questions because the different frameworks place all of this at different times and they interpret these differently. Um, so generally, you've got groups of people who either interpret like the bride is the church and the guests are secondary groups of people, whether those are for futurists, it's people who weren't raptured but come to Jesus during the tribulation. Um, for historicists, it's largely Jewish people that come to faith in Jesus Christ after uh, the Roman Catholic Church is destroyed. Um, for, for like preterists and idealists, the bride and guests are all kind of the same thing. It's the symbolism of like those who are there joining with the bridegroom. The bride is a guest at the wedding just as much and like in that world and in that culture. And so like they don't really distinguish out who the guests are. And when does it take place? Um, because futurists, right, generally believe this is what happens immediately following the rapture. But then we have timeline complications because the rapture took place in Revelation chapter 4. And so now we've just gone through all of the trumpets, bowls, and seals, and now we're jumping back to a time at the rapture. Um, some believe that this takes place at the second coming of Jesus, which is the end of the rapture, if you're a futurist, or like if you are an idealist um, that, that, that doesn't necessarily believe in a rapture, the marriage supper of the Lamb is when Christ comes back to the earth um, and joins all of his saints living and dead to him, right? Because remember, and, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, in a couple weeks when we get to the, the millennium again, but there's some that believe that we're kind of living in a spiritual millennium. And then at the end of that millennium, the living saints and dead saints will be joined when Jesus comes back all at the same time. There's called amillennialists. That's in your handouts. Um, it's in your, like your reference material from previous weeks. But others, what we would typically call dispensationalists, they believe typically that there is first a rapture, followed by a period of tribulation, followed by the return of Jesus Christ, and then the thousand year reign. And so that the rapture takes place, the marriage supper of the lamb takes place, but then seven years later, Jesus Christ returns, which is the next section. Um, but how all of this becomes very complicated. And we have to ask, like, when, what, where does all this fit within our framework? And how complicated are we making our framework to adjust for the timeline of Revelation? Like, are, are we allowing Revelation to inform our framework? Or are we allowing our framework to inform our reading of Revelation? Um, and it should be that we're allowing Revelation to dictate the framework for how we read it, right? The text tells us how to read it. We don't tell the text how it's supposed to be read. In the long end of the story, it is going to dictate what happens. That's right. At the end of the day, the text dictates it. I, I, if God decides to go differently than the way I think he should, um, you know, well. yeah, I'm not going to say, excuse me, God, and pull out my whiteboard. Like, all these different people have said this. Uh, why aren't you following? This is clearly the only best way we could have done it. Yeah, you're not following the rules, no? Didn't you know? A lot, of, a lot of ink has been spilled writing about this, and we have definitively proven that, uh, that, that this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> um, let's do Revelation 10, so the last one. Um, 
And then I fell down. Then I, John, fell down at his, the angel's feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold to the testimony of Jesus. <coughs> worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right. Trinitarian theology, once again. Like we've said, remember... In John's time, the concept of the Trinity didn't really exist the way it exists today, right? The language we use to describe the Trinity didn't come about for 300 years. Like, they believed in the reality of the Trinity, but exactly how it all interacts and exactly the nature of Jesus, Father, Son, and Spirit, like, was not, it was still emerging theology at that time. And here we have it all once again. And we've talked about how these images of Revelation to an audience that does not have from childhood, like taught to them, oh yeah, one God, three persons. It's real simple, right? Like we teach kids that and it's great. We should teach kids that. Um, but when you've been raised in that your whole life, you never really, you, you look for that in scripture. But for the disciples, they weren't taught that from childhood. They weren't taught about how God is three in one and you know how like, and then using various illustrations or whatever. They were just taught that there's one God, but also Jesus is the son of God and God. And wow, we have the Holy Spirit. All right, cool. Let's kind of figure this out as we go. And here we have worshiping God, right? Because the testimony of Jesus, right, is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is the Holy Spirit. That's one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit applied, like in Isaiah. Isaiah has like the sevenfold reality of the spirit. He's a spirit of truth and of wisdom and of prophecy, right? right? Prophecy is inherently tied to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So here in one sentence, worship God because the Son embodies the spirit of prophecy through his testimony. Um, the, we don't really know why John worshiped the angel, but like... I don't know, man, because he's in heaven and he's encountering crazy things. And at some point he just got overwhelmed and worshiped the angel. Like, I don't think he lost sight of who God was. Um, but we don't really know why. And anything is really conjecture. But he does. And the angel identifies as a fellow servant. And, and so let's talk about this. So not only do we have Father, Son, and Spirit here, right? Um, but, but prophecy is inherently speaking the words of God directed to an audience. And the testimony of Jesus is the words of God directed to his people. That is the gospels, right? It is the words of God spoken, not only about what has happened, but will happen. It is language, it is divinely inspired words given to people, to audiences. This letter is a prophecy. It says so itself, right? Divinely inspired words, right? Remember, prophecy isn't always like, and then in six years, this is going to happen, right? It's the message that God has for his people that is inherently prophetic. And often it comes with a call to action. Um, and, and all prophecy that we experience in this life is grounded in the fact that God the Father sent his son Jesus to live, die, raise again, and that his son Jesus is coming back. Any prophecy that we ever encounter in this life is nested in the reality of who the Father is. There is no prophecy apart from the fact that Jesus came as was prophesied by the Father. The Father inspired people to prophesy of Jesus' coming, and Jesus speaks of his return. And so any hope or prophetic fulfillment we have is the end cap of it, right? There is no prophecy that exists beyond the fact that Jesus is coming back to draw his people into the new heavens and new earth. That is the end of prophecy, the fulfillment of everything about Jesus. When we have new heavens and new earth, there is no prophecy beyond that. And so all of it has existed in the testimony. The testimony of Jesus is that he's the son of God. He came, he lived, he died, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. He is the king and he's coming back to inaugurate his kingdom. Or he's already inaugurated his kingdom and he's coming back to make his kingdom full. And we will join him. Um, and then ultimately the testimony of Jesus is incomplete without the prophecy that he is coming back. If Jesus just came, lived, died, and rose again, right? That's not enough. He's got to come back. Otherwise, he's just in heaven and we're down here and the world will continue to be evil forever until we die. Right? But it is only in the reality that he is coming back and he has testified that he is coming back, right? That, that, that the fullness of, and until that occurs, like the fullness of Jesus' testimony is yet to be fulfilled. Um, 
Craig Coaster in Revelation of the End of All Things says this, The heavenly scenes that conclude each major section of Revelation reiterate that God and the Lamb alone are worthy of praise. This same passage clarifies the nature of true prophecy and, by implication, the nature of the prophecy that John is writing. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. This expression can refer to the testimony that the community of faith has received from Jesus and to the testimony that they bear to Jesus in their own preaching. Everything points to Jesus, right? Or it should, right? The, the, everything in the life of the bride points to Jesus. There's no neutral. And so the believers, the readers of this audience have received the testimony of who Jesus is, that he's the king who came, lived, died, rose again, and is coming back. And now through their life, they are called to bear witness to that testimony, right? As a prophetic act, as trust in the prophetic act that Jesus is coming back, right? If we don't believe the prophecy that Jesus is coming back and is going to judge, then I can't bear witness. I can't make testimony to Jesus because that's part of who he is. Um, and so we can't separate out, you know, people have tried to separate out like the earthly person of Jesus from the spiritual reality that Jesus is the son of God who's coming back to draw his people to him. And that is, that can never be faithful witness to the lamb, right? Because any witness to the lamb must include the reality that Jesus is coming back. All right, let's, let's talk about the frameworks for this whole section. Um, Historicists, right, including the, the, the rejoicing of the saints, they see this, remember, because for them, Babylon was, the Roman, was the, the, the Roman Catholic Church and the fall of the Roman Catholic Church. And they are, this is, for them, this is the Protestant Church rejoicing at the downfall of Babylon. Um, for them, the presence of the Hebrew word hallelujah uh, uh, has led them to believe that after the papacy falls, Jews would convert to Protestantism. Um, and that like the making ready of the church demands the purging of Catholicism from within the church. Um, and when John worships the angel is, and is rebuked, they look at that and said, yeah, we shouldn't worship other created beings like saints or Mary or the other things that they attribute the Catholic church to worshiping. Once again, remember, historicists are largely Reformation writers and pretty much just don't like Catholicism. Um, and there's almost nobody that holds their interpretation firmly today. Preterists, right? They see parallels to the verses in like Revelation 11, 15 through 19. Like we talked about that where like, because uh, um, in that section you have like loud voices from heaven declaring the coming reign of God, the elders falling down and thundering from heaven. So like the, the, the sequence of events that we have all in here can be found throughout Revelation, but in four verses of Revelation 11, um, you have all of it together. You also have like the mentioning of God's saints and the referencing to fear God. Um, Revelation 11, 15 through 19 leads to the opening of the temple. So if we remember back in Revelation 11, you have a brief set of praise followed by the opening of the temple of God and an angel comes out of the temple. And then here you have the Revelation 19, 1 through 6, which leads to the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride. And therefore, they have this parallel. So Revelation 4 views uh, says this, The appearance of the bride prepared for marriage is thus equivalent to the opening of the temple and the full establishment of the new covenant. So like all of these specific pieces that we've talked about all occur only one other time in this close of proximity just before the temple opens. And the bride is now the temple or the Holy Spirit where God resides. And thus, this is the coming of the new covenant um, with the old covenant ending. And for them, preterists pretty much look that the fall of Jerusalem was the final end of the old covenant, right? They look at Jesus's words when he talks about how like this place will be destroyed um, like as a part of the covenant and like in that ultimately the final destruction of Jerusalem is the final judgment of the Old Testament covenant and then Jesus makes the new covenant. So basically for them, there's kind of like a transitory period transition when like the new covenant has already begun and the old covenant's not yet fully complete from when Jesus dies and rises again to when the, 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 the temple is destroyed. Um, 
And so for them, right, the, the, the opening of the temple, the creation of a new covenant with the bride happens at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD um, and begins the new covenantal relationship or it, 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 it solidifies forever that the only covenantal relationship between God and his people is around the marriage of the bride in Christ, not around the temple, which includes the Gentiles, the guests at the wedding. Futurists, right? So most futurists consider the bride to be exclusively the church um, and not national Israel. And so we're going to come to that in just a second because Israel is described throughout the Old Testament as an adulterous bride. Um, most futurists still hold to a salvation plan for Israel, but it typically remains separate from the salvation plan for the church. And that's, we'll talk about that later. Um, ultimately, it's still Jesus who makes the way, but how they accomplish that, like, is, is that's one of the main critiques against specifically dispensationalist readings. Um, generally, dispensationalists believe that there are still prophecies from the Old Testament that are made directed toward Israel that were not absorbed by the church. So like Paul, uh, some people look at Paul's writings and they say, hey, all of the Old Testament prophecies that haven't been fulfilled that spoke of Israel now speak of the church because they weren't really about a nation. They were about God's people and the church is now God's people. And so all those prophecies have been transitioned to the church that have not yet been made full. Whereas others say, no, there are still some prophecies that belong to Old Testament Israel and the people of Israel that were not absorbed by the church and therefore they still need to be fulfilled. And those have to do with things like the reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel, the restoration of the land of Israel. That's where Zionism comes from. And like the, this desire to create the nation state of Israel was largely pushed by Christians who felt that you had to have the kingdom of Israel for the kingdom of God and revelation to occur um, and trying to make prophecies be fulfilled. Um, but largely futurists, they typically would read the bride is the church and the guests at the wedding um, or, and, and are, are potentially uh, Jews um, or, or who have come to Christ or have Jews who have been encompassed under the salvation plan for faithful Israel, whatever that looks like. Um, they also typically see that the, the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place right after the rapture, which, once we said, poses some timelines. It made some interesting questions about like how the Jews can be the guests at the wedding then. Um, some see that like the, the bride, yes, the, the, the bride is like exclusively the raptured New Testament church. And then the guests become those who come to Christ during the period of tribulation because there are people that after the church has been raptured, there's more people that can be saved, um, which seem, which one of the critiques that people make of that is it sounds like there's multiple ways to get saved. Um, and then the response is, no, it's still belief in Jesus is how you do it, but you can just do it at different times, which that we'll get to that in a minute. We're getting to that in the next couple weeks, not in a minute, in a couple weeks. Um, and that like the guests would be like Old Testament believers. Like, cause for, for some dispensationalists or for some futurists, the bride is exclusively the church that was raptured, but all of the Old Testament saints like Abraham, Moses, David, right? The Old Testament people that didn't reject the Messiah, they would be the ones who are the guests, um, which... Then the argument is, though, it sounds like there's like class distinction in the kingdom of God, which is also complicated. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through the coming weeks. <coughs> we will talk about that a lot. No, well, I don't know if we will. We'll see. Idealists. Uh, they tend to look at, as I said, like the process of Jewish weddings, um, talking about how this points to like the, the time of the imminence of the coming of the bridegroom is here. And now we are at the marriage supper. Um, 
that, that uh, like throughout the entire Old Testament, the marriage of God and his people was announced in their covenantal relationship. When Christ took on flesh and died, he paid the dowry for his bride. So the death and resurrection of Jesus was the dowry paid to the father of, for the bride. And now we exist in the interval between when the dowry was paid and when the bridegroom comes to take the bride away to his father's house and the wedding ceremony. Because in the Jewish wedding custom, the groom had to go pay the bride price. And it wasn't like, all right, I've paid this. Let's go get the bride right now. There was a time of between, all right, now the wedding can happen. The wedding's happening. Um, and that that would be the interval that the church exists in today while we wait for the, uh, the groom to come and take the bride away. And it can happen at any moment. It's imminent. Um, so, yeah, that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Ultimately... This image is just the restoration. It's like it's God and his people coming together in, co it is restored covenant. That's what it is, right? If, if, like, all weddings point back to the reality of perfect relationship that existed between God and people in Eden, and then the marriage supper of the Lamb is the moment when perfect relationship is restored just like it was for God's people in him. Cool. Questions, thoughts, comments, yeah. concerns? Gene. Um, back on verse 5. Yes. Uh, the voice came out of the throne. We're saying that was uh, Jesus then? Um, I don't know. Or the Son of Man? So I don't know. It, it seems that it most likely would have to be either God the Father or the Son of Man. Um, or this Holy Spirit, right? Because if we remember the image, you have the Father on the throne, the Son of Man is standing next to the throne or seated next to him on the throne, and the Spirit is right in front of the throne, right? And then around all of those is where the elders and creatures are worshiping. Um, and that's not meant to establish necessarily hierarchy, like they're all there in the kingship place of the, of the heaven. Um, so if it's coming from the throne, it has to be part of the Godhead. It could be the Son, it could be... Um, the Father talking, but it is God speaking in that because no one else speaks from the throne but God. Whether that's God the Father, Son, or Spirit, I don't know. Yes? That last question, um, when does it take place? Yes. Um, the timing, could that be the mystery? Because remember in heaven, John was told, do not write. Right. And, 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 and then um, Jesus says, in his 24, Matthew 24, mm -hmm. no man knows the day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. So I, I'm just thinking everybody's trying to figure out the time because then they can try and strategize when yeah. he's coming. But yeah. that's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is like, is like, is perhaps the mystery of when it takes place, like what Jesus talks about, like not an hour or time, like no one knows but the Father in heaven. And, and so I guess when we ask that question, I, I'm not asking like, what year does it happen? It's more as I read the book of Revelation and I construct a timeline for reading Revelation, where does this fit within my timeline of the book of Revelation? If I want to read Revelation as a chronological series of events, then this takes place after all the other events have occurred. If I, and so like if I'm a, like a futurist, if this happens right after the rapture, then the timeline is messed up because the rapture took place in chapter four, then other things, and now I'm coming back to that event. Um, so yeah, we don't know when this is happening, right? Just like the, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins, right? We are waiting for the bridegroom. We are the wedding party. We're the bride. We got to be ready because the bridegroom's showing up at any moment. It's imminent. Um, it's happening. It's happening now. I just don't know if it's right now or a little bit later from now now. Right? Whoa. Hopefully not a little bit ago now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we're all out here eating while we're waiting. Yeah. We're we are prepared, we're postured, we're ready to go. Like it's go time. You know, it's like the You're sitting in the room with like there's the bridesmaids in their room and the groomsmen in their room and the fishing comes in and says, Hey guys, it's time to start and you gotta go get in positions right now. And then you're waiting for your cue. Um so yeah, like it is, it, it's kind of it's both of those. It's absolutely a mystery other than it's happening soon, right? And we need to be ready as to when, like chrono when it takes place in history. The more question is more is where do we find this event in the narrative 
timeline, for lack of a better term, of Revelation if we believe Revelation presents a clear timeline of events or if it speaks about spiritual realities. Um, like, for instance, if you're a historicist, right, and you thought the last thing that happened was the fall of the Catholic Church under Napoleon, well, that didn't, that didn't end anything. The Catholic Church is still here. It's bigger than it was then. Um, if you're a preterist who says, like, all this took place in Jerusalem, right, in 70 AD, okay, well, when did this marriage supper of the Lamb take place? Um, there is definitely a, uh, a view of preterism. It's called partial preterism. Um, and basically, they believe everything up to this point, really, up to the marriage supper of the Lamb, or even up to the thousand years, chapter 22, or chapter 20 through 22, took place in Jerusalem. And then this last section that doesn't as easily fit in their framework is still yet to come. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways you're trying to understand that. So. myself like as his child or as a disciple or as a you know friend of Christ but like it's when I'm together with other believers that that imagery of like the bride makes a lot more sense because it's like oh it's all of us together interacting with Jesus and I think even in the parable Jesus told a lot of times we were the guests in yeah. the stories but like when he talks about you know the or Paul talks about like the body of Christ or like the bride of Christ like that's all believers together I don't know. Angela brings up a great point, right? Like, can we read this as like the bride being like the corporate reality of the church, the people of God, whereas the guests could perhaps stand in for like each individual believer or the people who are there. And that's absolutely true. And actually a great example of that, because a lot of times when we talk about like when the, when the church is talked about, it's talked about corporately. And a great example that that we love to misconstrue because it doesn't make sense in English because we don't really distinguish second person plural from singular in English very much. Mm -hmm. So when Paul says like your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, it is your plural body. The church is the body of the Holy Spirit. We love to tell that to keep, tell kids like you got, did you know, Johnny, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That's not what Paul's saying. He's not saying Johnny's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He's saying your corporate body, the church, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You as a part of that body, like host the Holy Spirit in you, but but we definitely use that to guilt trip people of like, you know, you're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's like, that's not the language Paul's actually saying right there. <laughs> yeah, so that's not to say that like the Holy Spirit's not in you or that like we shouldn't do things to care for our bodies or things like that. It's saying that that's not the word Paul uses. But that's a separate, but great point, excellent. All right, let's wrap it up. Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that you're coming back. We, we, we thank, we're thankful that by the blood of your lamb that we are like able to be called the bride, that we are able to, to participate and be blessed to participate in the marriage supper of the lamb. God, we ask that as we go through this, this day, through this week, until we gather again and beyond, God, that we would continue to make ourselves ready through pursuing faithful witness to you. So we commit our time to you and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.